Well, hello and welcome to this week's Worship Moments. We are so glad you're here. Go ahead and throw down in the comments something that you're giving joy for this week, something you are thankful for this week. We're going to do this a couple times up until Thanksgiving, but uh, just throw down in the comments something you're thankful for this week. That would be really helpful. We have one big announcement tonight, and it is our Gator Seminole Share Down. I gotta be honest with you, 2020 has been really hard for a lot of reasons, but one of them has been that we needed to meet our budgetary goals, and that means fundraising for us. And, and to be honest with you, we just haven't been raising those, we haven't been meeting those goals. We haven't been raising the funds that we need to. And, and that's because of COVID-19. And, and fortunately though, this year, we kind of redreamt what the showdown was going to be. And we called it the share down. And we have a partnership with Gator Wesley to raise $20,000. And listen, we are already halfway there after the first week. So we raised $10,000 by Friday, which was awesome, and we are going into this next week uh, looking to raise another $10,000 between both us and Gator Wesley. So if you're watching this, if you're a parent or a friend or, or a grandparent or whatever, or, or if you're a student and you're like, hey, I could give $5, hey, I could give $10, I could not go to Chick-fil-A one day this week and give $10, I would really, really, really encourage you to do that. Uh, we appreciate all of those gifts, and anything we can do to help get closer to our goal will help make everything easier for us in the coming year. Um, anyway, I hope that you had a great week so far. I hope you're ready, excited for the next week, and uh, I hope you enjoy these worship moments together.
As I surveyed some of you as I got here, I asked some pointed questions about what you wanted in a ministry and what you wanted to hear and learn and worship and things like that. And so many of you wanted to study the Bible, which I thought was really, really interesting because, you know, uh, that's kind of why we're here. And, and some of you mentioned that you didn't have a clear vision of what the Bible is or why we study it. And some of you felt like you didn't even know where to start. And some of you felt like the Bible had been used for evil against people. And that last one, that last one stops me in my tracks. I mean, that, that one makes me think a lot, mostly because it's, it's kind of true. The Bible for all richness and goodness has been used countless times by countless people and people groups to spread hatred over love, to spread oppression over freedom and general disdain for the poor and the marginalized since like the beginning of time. And any sort of sinful perspective that you have on something that can be proven by use of the Bible, you can do it, right? You can find those things. All you do is you take a few phrases out of context, and then you can kind of oppress whoever you want, do whatever you want to do. For those reasons, a lot of people hate the Bible, and they write it off as antiquated, they write it off as unhelpful, and I can see why they arrive at those conclusions. The Bible is a complex book, and it says some things that are hard to come to grips with, if we're being honest. I want you to see that it's complex because of its construction. It was, it was written over the course of centuries by countless hands and people who have shared our faith or a faith very similar to ours and has now been translated or paraphrased and translated again by well-meaning groups and also not so well-meaning groups. The Bible's complex. You can buy a $3 version on Amazon, like paper or whatever, or you could spend $75 on a leather-bound version with fancy commentary and an engraved name on the front or whatever. And the truth is the Bible has also been debated and debated and debated and baited for centuries. The Bible is anything but simple. And in order for us to see its goodness, we need to start with the reality that it is complex. And we just need to accept this complexity. So because it's complex, uh, to get to know the Bible, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with it. And let's be honest, that's a lot of time that people either just don't have or don't care enough to set time aside for or whatever. The other thing is it takes energy and direction to work with the Bible. And those are things that we just don't have. And so what, what ends up inevitably happening is that we hear phrases from the Bible and we repeat them like, honestly, we do it out of context so often. And we place them in a situation in our lives to either excuse what we want to do, to make us look better, uh, or, or whatever, and assign blame to someone else. And then that becomes our framework for what the Bible is. So let me give you an example. Some, someone tells you that homosexuality is wrong because it's in the Bible. And at its face, that seems true. Homosexual intercourse is spoken of negatively in the Bible. But when someone says something like that, it negates the work that's happened since the scriptures were written and where we've, we've come to find uh, understand human sexuality different in a far more nuanced manner. And we've come to realize that we ourselves who identify in this way, or we find people in our lives that do identify in this way. If we simply just take random phrases from scripture, or even things that we simply attribute to scripture but aren't actually there, and place them outside of their contextual beginnings, we end up with this understanding or feeling about the Bible that's not only inaccurate, but it's changed our entire perspective on scripture entirely. Sometimes we do this thing, and we do this a lot, we, we attribute things to the Bible that aren't actually a part of it. Like we hear a phrase in the world, and it sounds good to us, it seems somewhat truthful, and so we attribute it to the Bible. Uh, I led worship for a friend of mine's church not, not very long ago. Do you guys remember when we used to have worship together? <laughs> I wasn't here for that, but I do remember at my old place. Uh, and he was in the middle of a sermon series called The Bible Doesn't Say That, which is a pretty bold way of saying, you know, whatever you think the Bible says is probably a lie. And, and he came up with a great set of phrases that we often throw around. You know all of them. Everything happens for a reason, or God helps those who help themselves, or, you know what the Bible says, hate the sin, love the sinner. There are a number of other phrases that, that might have a bit of truth to them, but we, then we attribute them to the Bible. And the truth is that the Bible doesn't say it, but we think it does. It's reframing something that isn't authentic to what Scripture actually is. 
So what we honestly need to do is recognize the authenticity of the Bible, the framework in which we understand the Bible, and then be honest about what it says and who said it and when it was said. So if we can be honest about all those things, then we will understand the scriptures as being helpful to our life of faith, which is what they were intended to be in the first place. Our relationship with the Bible is difficult, especially in this country. Uh, the Bible was, uh, was used to oppress slaves throughout the Civil War. It's currently being used against LGBTQ plus persons. It's been used to argue that certain people are going to hell or heaven and an assortment of other things that just aren't helpful for us. Uh, but we need to be honest about another hurdle that we have too. Uh, the Bible is daunting simply because of its size and it's frustrating because of its language. It often speaks in hyperbole and metaphor. And we probably grew up reading an inaccessible version of it in terms of its like colloquial language or whatever. And, and the thing has hundreds of pages. I mean, I think it averages out to about 1,200 pages. Uh, it's not that it's not entirely readable. I mean, many people do and have, and you, know, you should try it too. It was one of the things we had to do in seminary was read all of Scripture. But if you've ever opened up the Bible to Genesis and decided just to start reading, you can realize how daunting of a task that is. It needs energy and direction to do. So what I want to do, simply because you said you needed this, is over the next weeks, decode this a little bit. I want to walk us through certain pieces of it. Uh, I want you to get a sense of what it means to read the Bible. And at the end of this, my hope is that you can open up the scriptures in a way that is more helpful and meaningful for you, even you know, setting aside what you think about it today. Uh, I need to say this first. The Bible is a good book. It's a holy book. And I love it, and I want you to fall in love with it too, because it is definitely worth your time. The, the Bible tells us stories, and it challenges us and encourages us. It guides our paths, like the psalmist says in Psalm 119. It, it is the one way we have in the here and now to see who God is, because the Bible reveals God in Jesus to us. The Bible has quite literally been everything for Christians, and the Bible has brought hope and good news to the furthest reaches of our world. So it is a good book. But it's precisely because of the things that I just talked about that we have some hang-ups with the Bible. And we need to be honest about those hang-ups. So this is where it's going to start with you. If someone told you something harmful that supposedly came from the Bible, I need you to externalize that story. I would encourage you to talk about it a little bit tonight with someone who's close to you. Or maybe if it's not even too vulnerable, maybe you put it down in the comments right now. I mean, something that, you know, the Bible, you've been told about the Bible that makes you hesitant about it or something. Because we need to live with the Bible a little bit, and some of that requires an honesty session and a little bit of a healing process first. Otherwise, it's never going to have a stake in your life. I want you to understand that this is how I understand the Bible. The, this is a good thing, in other words. The Bible is meant to be wrestled with, just like God. God wants us to wrestle with him, and, and because the Bible reveals God to us, it's okay to wrestle a little bit with Scripture. We need to fight back. We need to argue a little bit with it. And don't worry if you feel like that maybe is changing the power dynamic. It's going to convict you. It's going to be instructive in your life. You push back against the Bible and it's going to push back against you. But that relationship of pushing back against the Bible and it pushing back against you, it's going to make you fall in love with it. You know, there was this really stupid phrase when I was growing up uh, that surrounded the Bible called Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. There was actually a band that started their song. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. As if it was some sort of manual for outlining what we're supposed to do. Uh, Rachel Held Evans had an amazing book a few years ago in which she, she tried to live a year of biblical womanhood. That's what she called it. And in which she found herself like sitting on the roof and covering her head and calling her husband master. And she broke, up, broke down that manual nature of the Bible by showing it that the Bible actually says a lot more, especially to women, than it seems like it is. It's not just a set of rules. It's a set of stories that have been told time and time and time again. They have been read to us. We've read them. And every time that that happens, we learn a little bit more about who God is and what God's doing in our life. But it's not because we read a set of instructions. It's because we spent time with a story and we placed ourselves within it. 
the Bible is meant to be wrestled with. And if anyone tells you different, just leave them alone, like pay them very little attention. But I want to start with the basics, having said all that. Some of this is going to seem very elementary for some of you. Uh, just remember that not everybody watching or who's a part of Wesley has the same history or background of some of you. And, um, you know, it, sometimes it's hard to ask those, those questions or you don't want to ask those questions. And so I just want to start with the basics. The Protestant Bible, and that's the Bible that Methodists use, has two separate Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Together, they're comprised of 66 books, and some of you might have grown up Roman Catholic or even Eastern Orthodox, or maybe you know people who are. Their, their books have more. They have books called an Apocrypha, uh, and they have 73 in the Roman Catholic Bible and 78 in the Eastern Orthodox Bible. So there are different Bibles out there. These books were written over a period of centuries by many, many people. Um, some people believe that 2 Peter is the last book written in the Bible, and it could be as late as the 2nd century AD. So th this is comprised over um, many, many, many years. These books were often attributed to writers that we're also now nearly certain could not have been their authors. Uh, many of these books were passed down orally. Uh, when writing was not possible or not feasible and many weren't literate, the only way to pass these stories down was to pass them down to the people. And so slowly these stories began to be written down. It's also important to know that we don't have any original documents. None. And the oldest documents that we have are fragmented. Our oldest fragments of them are from like the second and third century. This is important because you'll hear people say all the time, I just believe what the Bible says, as if those words were dictated straight out of the mouth of God. And surely you've heard this many times over in church or with friends in church. And I want to be clear, Methodists do not believe this about the Bible. We believe that the Bible is inspired by God and revelatory to, uh, to us about who God is. But in no way is the standard Methodist belief to say that God wrote the scriptures by hand. I want to be super clear here. I believe that God played a role in combining our scriptures into the Bible. And I believe that God wants to reveal himself to us. And I think that's how we learn about Jesus. And I believe that God's hand is in our scriptures. But that's very different to say that these are God's writings. The other thing about this is the Bibles that you and I read are in English. And that, believe it or not, is not the original language of these documents. The Old Testament, which tells the story of the Israelite people, and which we'll talk about more in depth next week, was written in ancient Hebrew, which is, um, it's called an abjad, which means it actually has no vowels either. Uh, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. Um, and, and something that you should know about Koine Greek and the way that it's written in our New Testament is that there are no spaces or punctuation between words. And, and both of these language, both, both languages, both uh, ancient Hebrew and Koine Greek, are effectively dead. There are no street uh, speakers still alive for this. Um, and for centuries, they were copied by hand until the advent of the printing press. And we have provable places in the scriptures where certain monks or groups of monks or whatever would add or delete things as necessary. So those are things that you need to know about the translation and, or at least the writing of it. And the other thing about it is that they need translation. And so if you've ever sat in a foreign language class and had to translate something from English to Spanish or then from French to English or something, you know that certain things just don't quite work out, right? There are cultural things that don't quite cross over or whatever. There, there are a, a literal translation. If you type something into Google Translate, a literal translation just doesn't work. There's going to be mistakes. And to further complicate things, Jesus likely did not speak Greek, I mean, by any scholar's standard. But the books that were written about him were written in Greek. Jesus, Jesus spoke in a form of Aramaic, uh, but the Gospels weren't written until years after he was gone. I mean, I think we place Mark as the first Gospel in between 66 and 70 AD, which is like a lifetime or two since Jesus was gone. So that means that none of these books were written by eyewitnesses. None of the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, even though they read like that. The other important thing to remember is that the way that we interact with the Bible in this country now is far different than we could have ever conceived of it before. Uh, if you take Paul's letters as an example, I mean, they were, they were written to communities uh, and they would be read by the community in the place of worship. Uh, if for no other reason than most people were illiterate. Uh, nowadays, you have it on your phone or you could listen in the car. Or I have, I'm in my office right now, I have... Um, conservatively 15, 16 Bibles sitting over there on one shelf. 
But in the midst of all this, when, we, when we're faced against the academic reality of like, well, that's not true, or that's not true, or what we thought here wasn't true, or whatever, uh, I want you to know that one thing holds true here. The Bible is a miraculous work. It's a book that still inspires holiness. It still inspires joy in the people who read it. And it has guided Christianity for ages, and it will for many years. It has morphed and changed a little bit. But just like David says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so when we read it, I want us to see that. John Wesley, who, who we're, we're named after, I hope you know that. John Wesley is uh, kind of the founder of Methodism. Um, he once called himself a man of one book. And that, that one book was scripture for him. The Bible was everything that was needed to guide his path and his life of faith. And, and he committed his life to studying it and praying with it and living with it and wrestling with it. And he argued with his mother about it. I mean, he was serious that this book was everything. And so we're going to call this series for the next few weeks, One Book. And I hope over the next few weeks, you're going to see that uh, there is a faith worth pursuing and a God worth falling in love with inside the pages of this. And, and if for no other reason than in the midst of these pages, it tells a story of a man who laid down his life to die for you. And so in the midst of all of the nonsense of the Bible or all the things that we're like, well, I didn't know it didn't say that, or I didn't know I was supposed to believe that or whatever. In the midst of all this, I want you to hear this, that God still laid down his life for you and it's written in these scriptures. And so it will be good and holy and honoring for us to give this as much time and energy and passion as we can. I want you to be honest about where you are with the Bible. I want you to tell a couple friends. And then strap in because we're, we're going to learn a little bit about the Bible this, this, uh, over the next couple of weeks. That it's going to give us some energy and some time and some direction. Which is exactly what's needed for us to fall in love with these scriptures. Amen.